let's consider this uh, tetrahedron where uh, we have uh, four faces and um, we are considering the four normals, these uh, red uh, arrows here. These are the normals to the faces of uh, the tetrahedron. If we consider three vectors, this vector here that I can call M1, and then I have another vector M2 along this other edge, and then I have another vector M3, and these three vectors go along uh, three edges of the tetrahedron. So M1 goes along this edge here, M2 goes along this edge here, and M3 goes along this edge here. By using these three vectors, M1, M2, M3, we can describe the geometry of the tetrahedron. In particular, we can find the areas of the faces, and therefore we can find the area of the tetrahedron, and in, in principle, we can also find the volume. Now, let me sketch how you can find the areas by having these uh, three vectors. So, for example, this vector M1 has a certain length. We know the direction because the, dire the direction is uh, along this edge of the tetrahedron. Now, assume that we choose M1 such that its magnitude is actually this side. So this, um, I mean, it's this length here, which coincides with the, the length of the side of the tetrahedron. So the vector is actually this one. Then the magnitude of M2 is equal to this other side, this other edge of the tetrahedron. And then you understand the idea. So M3 will be this length here. So the, the magnitude of M3 will be this one and the direction is the one that we have already discussed. Now, let's uh, call uh, these uh, red uh, arrows L1, L2, L3, and L4. So L1 will be this uh, arrow. Then we have uh, L2, which I define to be this one here. So this is L2. Then we have L3, and then we have L4. L1 is the normal to the phase of uh, this surface here that I'm sketching, and uh, its magnitude will be the area of this face. And how can we find L1 by considering M1, N2, and M3? Well, we have to consider that L1 is given by one half the cross product between M3 and M2, like this. So when you take the cross product between M3 and M2, you get the area of this parallelogram here. And when you divide by two, you get the area of uh, this triangle here. So it's not too complicated to understand. And similarly, you can uh, define L2 as one half M1 cross product with M3. Similarly, you can define L3 to be given by one half the cross product between M2 and uh, M1 in this order, because when you take the cross product between M1 and M2, you get something that points upwards if you use the, the usual rules with vectors. But when you take the cross product, product between M2 and M1, you get this direction here. Now, at this point, you can also find a way to rewrite L4 in terms of M1, M2, and M3 and their cross products. For example, you can define this vector here, and this vector is simply given by M2 minus M1, and then you can define, uh, for instance, uh, this vector here, and this vector is simply given by M3 minus M1. And so you can define L4 to be given by one half, and then you have the cross product between um, M2 minus M1. And then you take the cross product with uh, M3 minus M1. Now, you can expand this, this expression, so you can write one half M2 cross M3. Then you have 
minus m2 cross m1 and then you have minus m1 cross m3 and then when you take the cross product between uh, m1 with itself we get zero because m1 is parallel to itself and when we consider two parallel vectors and in particular we take uh, their i mean their cross product we get zero so this is what we obtain but now you can see that according to the definitions that we have uh, in here you can see that this part for example is equal to minus l1 then when you have this multiplied by one half this uh, will give rise to minus l3 from the definition here and then when you have this multiplied by one half you can see that this will give rise to minus l2 so we can see that l4 can be written as a linear combination of uh, l1 l2 and l3 this basically means that we can describe the geometry of our tetrahedron not only by considering the three vectors m1, m2, and m3, but we can also choose l1, l2, and l3. So we can choose three of the four normals to the surface of the tetrahedron. So we have found that the sum over i from 1 to 4, in this case, of the vector li, this is just equal to the zero vector. So this is a condition for uh, the normals to the surface of the, the tetrahedron. Now you can also describe the areas of uh, the different phases. For example, the, the area here is given by L1, the mode of L1. So the, the mode of L1, which can also be written as the square root of L1 dot L1, this is just uh, the area of uh, this phase. And similarly for the areas of the other phases. And you can see that there is some kind of symmetry in uh, this problem because if we rotate this vector l1 by any quantity the dot product between l1 and l1 remains the same so this is actually an invariant quantity if we rotate all these vectors by the same amount so l1 l2 and l3 by the same amount we get basically something that does not change one way to show this is by using the so-called poly matrices. The poly matrices that we can label as sigma j, if we consider this matrix as sigma j and we multiply this by Lj1, for example, so Lj1 are the components of the vector L1, which are, for example, L11, L21, and L31. Now, if you consider this vector, so this will become another vector, and uh, you multiply it by itself. So we, we, we have to write sigma i li1, we change this index, and we are summing over i and also over j. When you do the summation, you can also rewrite this in the following manner. So for, for convenience, you can write it as one half sigma j sigma i plus sigma i sigma j due to symmetry lj1 li1 well this is just equal to the anti-commutator between sigma j and sigma i but the anti-commutator of poly matrices is just equal to 2 delta ij and this will give rise to basically delta ij lj1 l i1 but this is just equal to l1 vector squared so it's the mode squared of the vector l1 and you can see here that if we take a vector l1 and we act with the poly matrix on this vector so we take basically the dot product between sigma and l1 this means uh, sigma 1, L11, plus sigma 2, L12, plus sigma 3, L13. You can see that if we act with these poly matrices, the result of, of the dot product does not change. So poly matrices encode 
information regarding rotations in a, a three-dimensional uh, space. And this means, this is important because it, this means that uh, when we want to define a quantum theory, when we consider operators, the component L11, for example, this will be proportional to the matrix sigma 1. So it makes sense to consider that L11 will be pro proportional to sigma 1 because you can see here that the first part, I mean, the, the first component here is L11, but remember that here, when we take a look at this equation, we are considering scalars because this is a vector and these three are the components of uh, this vector. So these are treated like numbers. It's as if they are numbers. And when we act with uh, the, um, this matrix, uh, this, this set of matrices sigma, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, you can see that the first component is replaced by, by this. So we have this uh, first element multiplied by sigma 1. So we, I mean, this is just like a postulate because uh, it is not possible to, to motivate this uh, rigorously. And um, it makes sense to consider the fact that the component L11, when we want to quantize our theory, this will become sigma 1, proportional to sigma 1, and similarly L21 will become proportional to sigma 2, and similarly L13 will be proportional to sigma 3. When we quantize the theory, since uh, these uh, poly matrices are related to angular momentum, the commutation relation between the components L, I, 1 and L, J, 1 will be of the following form. So we have the imaginary number I, then we have some constant L0 squared, epsilon I, J, K, the, this is just the levi civita symbol, and then here we have L1, K, so here you have, you have to sum over K, and this is just like a commutation relation between uh, angular momenta, the components of angular momenta, it's exactly the same behavior. You can see that this L0 squared is a new constant, and this new constant is related to how these quantities are discretized. So they will become uh, operators, so they will not span a continuous range, but rather they will take only discrete values, and those discrete values are related to this constant L0 squared. L0 is a length, so L0 squared is, a, is an area, and uh, this uh, unit of area is related to the Planck length. In particular, L0 is of the order of the Planck length, so when we square it, we get, we get something of the order of the Planck length squared, obviously. This has to do with the fact that uh, the smallest unit of area should be related to the Planck length squared, so it is of the order of uh, the Planck length uh, squared, and this in turn has to do with the fact that uh, we cannot really talk about length when we move below the Planck length. It doesn't make any sense because when we are considering a scale that is of the order of the Planck length, space-time can no longer be viewed as a smooth manifold and anything smaller than the Planck length is uh, quote-unquote hidden inside its own mini black hole.